just before this talk, I, I went to the restroom and I noticed a little health sign uh, above the taps saying, um, take 20 seconds to, to beat influenza. <laughs> now, that word, influenza, very interesting word. Lewis talks about it in the discarded image. If you went to your doctor in medieval times with, a, with an unexplained illness, um, the doctor would say, I don't know what's wrong with you. It's probably the influence currently in the air. That is to say, the influence of the planets. And if he was an Italian doctor, he would say, it is the influenza that is in the air. <laughs> and that word got into our medical textbooks and has stayed there ever since. But it's related to the planets. Next time you suffer from flu, <laughs> look up. <laughs> anyway, here's a more detailed uh, diagram of the cosmos as it was understood to be in pre-Copernican times. This was all accepted science, remember. This wasn't superstition. It was how the universe was thought to be by pre-Copernican cosmologists. The word Cosm in Greek, in Greek uh, means organize, structure, arrange, embellish. It's where we get the word cosmetics from. You know, when you apply cosmetics to your face, you're bringing out the structure and the pattern of your features. Cosmologists bring out the structure and pattern of the cosmos, the universe, as they believe it to be, and this was how they used to believe it to be. And Lewis was naturally very interested in it um, because because of its implications for the study of medieval literature. I recently came across this page of notes that he made uh, in his edition of Chaucer. Chaucer's Knight's Tale has the characters of the planets woven into the plot, Lewis points out. Um, and here are a page of his notes uh, showing how the, the 24 hours of, of, of Sunday, are each hour of Sunday is governed by a different one of these seven planets. Um, so Sunday, you can just about make out that little symbol, a circle with a dot in the middle, that represents the sun. And the sun governs the first hour of Sunday, that's why Sunday is called Sunday. And then it governs the eighth hour again, and then the 15th hour, and then the 22nd hour on this rotating basis. So it's interesting that the, the first hour of the next day is governed by the moon, which is why Monday follows Sunday. And if you work through this whole system, you, you work out how each day of the week uh, got its name. We're referring to this old system every day of our lives, though we've forgotten it. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday represent Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, and Saturn. If you think of it in Spanish, it's much easier to, to identify. Martes, Miércoles, Jueves, Viernes. So we're referring to this system, though we've forgotten it. And Lewis wanted to retain uh, an understanding of it because he thought it was essential for a proper understanding of old literature. He thought that this old image of the cosmos should not be discarded. He called his, books, he called his book The Discarded Image. But really, the, <laughs> the argument was that it should be retained. And if you know his series of interplanetary adventures, you will know how Lewis used these planetary um, symbols very explicitly in his books. The first of the trilogy is called Out of the Silent Planet. It's set on Mars, a very medieval Mars. And in the second book, it's set on Venus, a very medieval Venus. And in the third book, which is set on Earth, the planetary powers come down to Earth to bring about the end of the story. Lewis used these... Uh, these heavenly characteristics very explicitly in this Ransom trilogy. Why? Well, he said that the characters of the planets as conceived by medieval astrology seem to me to have a permanent value as spiritual symbols, which is especially worthwhile in our own generation. Of Saturn we know more than enough, but who does not need to be reminded of Jove? The word astrology is worth talking about there. A lot of people, as soon as they hear the word astrology, think occult, satanic, evil, wrong. How can Lewis, as a Christian writer, have been interested in astrology? Well, it all depends what you mean by astrology. 
Astrology just literally means the study of the stars, and there's nothing necessarily wrong about studying an aspect of God's creation. It all depends what you do with that study. If it leads you to worship the stars, that's clearly unchristian. If it leads you to think that these supposed influences control your behavior and overrule your free will and your responsibility before God, that too is a wrong use of astrology. But there's also a right use. And the most obvious example of good astrology is the wise men who follow the star to Bethlehem. We have seen his star in the east, they say, and we have come to worship him. But they were astrologers. Their astrology led them to Christ. That is good astrology. So we shouldn't treat astrology as a dirty word, and C.S. Lewis means it in that good sense. Medieval astrology provides us with a set of spiritual symbols which are of permanent value, especially worthwhile in our own generation, he says. Why does he say that? Well, it's because he's just come out of the Great War, the First World War, and of Saturn we know more than enough, he says. Saturn was the worst planet, according to pre-Copernican cosmologists. Saturn's influence was disastrous, brought about old age and sickness and death. And having just come through the First World War, a very Saturnine experience, if you like, Lewis said of Saturn, we know more than enough. But he also thought that that was a a historical accident. It wasn't an eternal truth about the nature of the universe. A much better representation of the heart of spiritual reality in Lewis's mind was conveyed by the qualities of Jupiter, Jove, the kingly, magnanimous, festive, joyful planet. Let's talk a little bit more about Jove, about Jupiter. This is how Lewis describes him in the discarded image. He says, Jupiter is the king. The character Jupiter produces in people would now be very imperfectly expressed by the word jovial and isn't very easy to grasp. We may say that it is kingly, but we must think of a king at peace, enthroned, taking his leisure, serene. The jovial character is cheerful, festive, yet temperate, tranquil, magnanimous. He is the best planet. And in 1935, Lewis wrote a long, detailed poem all about the seven heavens. And this is how he talked about Jupiter in that poem. Let me read you the Jupiter lines. Soft breathes the air, mild and meadowy, as we mount further, where rippled radiance rolls about us, moved with music, measureless the waves joy and jubilee. It is Jove's orbit, filled and festal, faster turning with arc ampler. From the isles of tin, Tyrian traders in trouble steering came with his cargoes, the Cornish treasure that his ray ripens. Of wrath ended and woes mended, of winter past and guilt forgiven, and good fortune, Jove is master, and of jocund revel, laughter of ladies, the lion-hearted, the myriad-minded, men like the gods, helps and heroes, helms of nations just and gentle are Jove's children, work his wonders. On his wide forehead, calm and kingly, no care darkens, nor wrath wrinkles, but righteous power and leisure and largesse, their loose splendors have wrapped around him, a rich mantle of ease and empire. Now I was reading that poem to myself one night in bed in uh, 2003, when five words from it jumped off the page at me. Winter past and guilt forgiven. I did a double take. I've read about the passing of winter and the forgiving of guilt in another of Lewis's works, I said to myself. That's as good a five-word summary of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe as you might ask to meet. The White Witch's winter passes and Edmund's guilt is forgiven. So I began to look a bit more closely at the, the imagery associated with Jupiter in this poem, and I saw all sorts of connections. Lion-heartedness, for instance. 
helms of nations, just and gentle. Hmm, like King Edmund the just, Queen Susan the gentle, and so on and so forth. I thought to myself, have I stumbled across something real here? It felt pretty likely. I wasn't looking for it, it just kind of occurred to me. I wasn't trying to twist things like I was with my Shakespeare play theory. <laughs> and I thought, well, there are another six planets and there are another six books. Is it possible that they all match up? And it was easy to see that they did. But before we come on to that, let's stay with Jupiter and the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Because as I began to investigate this theme, this, this vein of imagery, I noticed a very interesting thing. In a very little-known book by C.S. Lewis called Arthurian Torso, he said this. It's a, it's a book about the poetry of his friend Charles Williams. And, and Lewis says this, when Williams writes of Jupiter's red-pierced planet, Williams assumes that the huge reddish spot which astronomers observe on the surface of Jupiter is a wound, and the redness is that of blood. Jupiter, the planet of kingship, thus wounded, becomes another ectype, that's to say another reflection of the divine king wounded on Calvary. Now, I really sat up when I noticed this, because this shows us that Lewis had a very explicit connection between Jupiter and the sacrifice of Christ, which, of course, he reworks at the heart of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe isn't just a story about the passing of winter and the forgiving of guilt. It's also about the means by which that guilt is forgiven, the shedding of blood, which Lewis thought was a jovial, had a jovial connection. And in addition to that, the story is all about kingship. Jupiter is the king, and you remember how Aslan is introduced in this book. The children don't know who he is at the start. They think he might be a man. But Mr. Beaver says, Aslan, a man? He's the king of the wood. Don't you know who is the king of the beasts? He isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And the story is really a clash of kingship between Edmund and Peter. Who's going to become king of Narnia? Will it be Peter under the White Witch, under, under Aslan, or will it be Edmund under the White Witch? Edmund has been ensnared, you remember, by the witch's promise that she wants a boy who would be king of Narnia after I am gone. Edmund becomes convinced that this is his destiny. He wanted to be prince and later a king. He thinks about Turkish delight and about being a king. We tend to remember the Turkish delight, but actually it's kingship that really motivates Edmund's treachery. He wants to become a king in order to pay Peter back for calling him a beast. And then uh, he suddenly realizes that it didn't look now as if the witch intended to make him king. That's when she holds the knife to his throat. He's a quick learner. <laughs> And out of nowhere, Father Christmas turns up, shouting, long live the true king. The true king, of course, is Aslan, and he has his own plans for the four children. Aslan shows Peter the castle where you are to be king, and the four thrones, in one of which you must sit as king. You will be high king over all the rest. Over all the rest, including Edmund. Because Edmund, of course, uh, eventually has his guilt forgiven by the blood of Christ, the jovial blood of Christ. So it's for these reasons, and many others, which I don't have time to go into, that I've come to the conclusion that The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was written to embody and express the Jupiter influence, the jovial influenza, if you like, Jupiter imagery allows Lewis to, to give us a, jo a jovial plot, a story of winter passing and children becoming kings and queens, a story of a kingly, lion-hearted saviour figure who brings that very thing about. But also, the jovial imagery allows Lewis to bring in ornamental details, which others otherwise seem rather confusing, like the appearance of Father Christmas. Have you ever wondered about Father Christmas? What's he doing there? Lots of people have objected to him. 
including one of Lewis's good friends called Roger Lansling Green. He said to Lewis, you ought not to include Father Christmas, he doesn't belong there. But Lewis kept Father Christmas in against these objections, so he obviously thought there was a good reason to have him in there. But what? Because there's no Christ character known as Christ in Narnia, so there can be no Christmas, so there can be no Father Christmas. Have you ever thought about it? It doesn't make logical sense. What, what do they mean by Christmas in Narnia? People have taken this as evidence that Lewis just slopped the books together in an afternoon. If this jovial imagery was his governing purpose, it makes much better sense, makes perfect sense for Lewis to include Father Christmas because, well, in his university lectures, Lewis used to say this, those born under Jupiter are apt to be loud-voiced and red-faced and jolly. It is obvious under which planet I was born. <laughs> because he himself was loud-voiced and red-faced and jolly. He was a great booming man with a hearty voice and a florid, rubicund face. He looked like a prosperous farmer or a pork butcher, people used to say. So he used to joke that he himself had been born under Jupiter. Now, Father Christmas, loud-voiced, red-faced, jolly, the bringer of jollity, is the nearest thing we have in our popular modern culture to the jovial personality, the, this Jupiter archetype, which Lewis thought had otherwise all but been forgotten in the Saturnine 20th century. Here's a medieval woodcut showing Jupiter's influence. There's Jupiter sat up in the heavens. Down on Earth are the children who exhibit his influence. You see there on the, in the foreground a coronation scene. In the middle ground on the left you can see a man kneeling for judgment. And in the background you can just make out horses and hounds hunting a white stag, the noblest quarry that kings and queens in medieval romances would hunt. And Lewis puts all these elements into the lion, the witch and the wardrobe and many others besides. As for the other six books, let us go very quickly through some of them um, to show how they match up with the other six planets. Prince Caspian is the Mars book. Why? Well, as everybody knows, Mars was the god of war, and this is a war story, the Civil War of Narnia, the Great War of Deliverance, as it's called in a later book. If you saw the recent film version, you won't have missed the military events. They really went to town on the battles. Yes, but um, what about that other major theme of imagery running through Prince Caspian that has to do with trees and forests? You see the tree, uh, trees on the cover here. Caspian's just about to be knocked off his horse by that tree. The trees come to the battle at the end of the book. Lucy tries to wake the trees. Why all these trees? Well, I didn't know this uh, when I stumbled across this idea, but I discovered it as I, as I began to do my research, that Mars wasn't always and only a god of war. He was originally a vegetation deity. He was associated with trees and forests. He brought the trees back to life after winter, which is why the third month of the year, March, is called March. It's sacred to Mars in this capacity. He was known as Mars Silvanus. Here's a, a, a mural from Pompeii showing Mars in his twin capacities as god of war, yes, with his shield and his spear and his helmet, but he's standing against a backdrop of burgeoning vegetation. And Lewis puts both aspects of the martial influence into Prince Caspian. Aslan gives the great war cry, you remember, that summons everyone to the final battle, but Aslan also enters the story amongst dancing trees. He can wake the trees, though Lucy can't. She tries to, but fails. What Lewis is trying to suggest here is that Aslan is the, the incarnation, if you like, of the martial spirit which is otherwise spread abroad across the rest of the tale. A story of boys hardening into knights, of the girls romping in bacchanalian revelry with the growing trees and the swaying vines. It's Lewis's attempt very sophisticatedly to, to suggest that there's a harmony between the Christ character and the cosmos that he inhabits. The same spirit upholds it all. And indeed all sorts of ornamental details, again, like you remember that chess piece that the children discover at the start of the story, a little chess knight 
It has to be a knight with a little ruby red eye because knightliness is the inner meaning of this story. Prince Caspian is the Mars book. The Voyage of the Dawn Treader is the Sun story, which you could guess from the title alone. This is a story about a journey towards the rising sun. Aslan comes flying out of a sunbeam. He scatters light from his mane at the eastern edge of the world. What perplexed me about this story was the fact that Eustace is turned into a dragon and is then undragoned. What did that have to do with the sun, if anything? Well, this statue shows the Greek god of the sun, Apollo, the god of light, who went around slaying dragons. He was known as Apollo Soroctonus, and he's killing that lizard there with the beams from his eyes. There's a famous episode all about this in Homer's Hymn to Apollo. Soroctonus, lizard slayer. You know, a dinosaur is a monstrous lizard. Soroctonus, lizard slayer. Or lizard, dragon, serpent, worm, they're all the same thing. So when Eustace is undragoned by Aslan in this book, it's another manifestation of Aslan's solar personality. He embodies, he encapsulates the solar spirit in his own person in this book, just as he was martial in Prince Caspian and jovial in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Dawn Treader is the sun book. Speeding up now, we don't have time to go into this in detail, but the silver chair is the moon book. Again, you might guess this from the title alone. Silver was the metal of the moon. Um, this is a story about wetness and wanderings of lunacy. The lunar influence made you a lunatic. All sorts of beautifully worked imagery in this story, including one little detail. You remember those two horses that the children used to escape from Underland on? They're called Coal Black and Snowflake, and they are based on the two horses, one black, the other white, though they both look white in this image, uh, which drew the moon's chariot across the heavens in mythology. The horse and his boy is the Mercury story, Mercury the messenger, the, the god of words, the god of... Um, speed, swiftness. There was one lion, but he was swift of foot. The magician's nephew is the Venus story. Venus being the planet of creativity, fertility, beauty, sexuality, motherliness, apples, western gardens, and all good things. The last battle, let's spend just a little bit more time on this, is the Saturn story. <clears throat> And that's what Lewis is trying to depict in the way that the faithful Narnians remain loyal to Aslan despite all appearances to the contrary. You remember how Tyrion says uh, that this Tashlan nonsense must all be a cheat. And Jewel, the unicorn, says it may be that this terrible mouth, the stable door that we have to go through, it may be a doorway to Aslan's country and we will sup at his table tonight. They remain loyal to Aslan, even amidst all the disasters that beset them. If this theory is correct, why did Lewis never tell anyone what he was up to? I mean, surely the fact that he nowhere in his letters or his conversations is recorded as revealing this secret to anybody, doesn't that mean that I'm mistaken, barking up the wrong tree? But why would he have told anyone? We know that he had a capacity for secretiveness. A man who can keep his marriage secret can easily keep a literary code secret. But even if we didn't know that, we know that he wrote the Kappa element in romance. He wrote an essay about this, for goodness sake. We ought to expect him to do this. It's entirely in character. The planetary influence in each book is the the hidden atmosphere, the, the inner flavour, the secret meaning that we are, that we look along. It's the, it's the field of vision within which the whole story arises. Lewis once said that um, the characters of the planets need to be seized in an intuition, not built up out of concepts. So if you think about the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and its atmosphere, you are intuiting the character of Jupiter, assuming Lewis has been successful. 
which he may not have been, but you know, that's a separate question. I think that in intent, at any rate, his purpose was to give us in narrative form, in story form, the same thing that Holst gives us in musical form. When you came in, you heard the, the Planet Suite playing, and we'll have it at the end as you file out too. Lewis loved the Planet Suite. He said it was a rich and marvelous work that moved him very greatly. And in Holst's Planet Suite, we are immersed musically, wordlessly, into the planetary characters. Lewis has done a similar thing in story form. But when Peter says, by Jove, as he does a couple of times in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he, he has no understanding of what he's really saying. He doesn't realize that he's in a world and in a story that, is, that has... Jove at the back of it. And he, um, in his ignorance, he represents that, that common human condition that I touched upon earlier when I was talking about our natural tendency to be oblivious to the most obvious thing. And throughout his Christian writings, Lewis makes this point that we have a tendency to overlook the most fundamental thing. In mere Christianity, for instance, he says, since that divine power, if it exists, would not be one of the observed facts, but a reality which makes them, no mere observation of the facts can find it. And in his book on prayer, he says, we may ignore, but we can nowhere evade the presence of God. The world is crowded with him. He walks everywhere, incognito. And again, in his book on miracles, he writes, God is opaque by the very fullness of his blinding actuality. God is too big for us to see, like the large words which escape us on maps. But God saves us by becoming local, personal, concentrated, incarnated in Christ, in Jesus. We can't see him in his cosmos, he's too big. He comes to us in just the right form, in the person of Jesus. And in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, although the children don't know Jove in the story at large, they do know Jove in the person of Aslan, the kingly, lion-hearted Aslan, who bleeds for the traitor, and who does away with winter and who romps with the girls. You remember that phrase from the poem, jocund revel, laughter of ladies, who crowns the children, promises them eternal kingship and queenship. Once a king in Narnia, always a king in Narnia. Once a queen in Narnia, always a queen in Narnia. And so on and so forth. And that's enough for the children. They don't know at the level of their savoir intellect that their world is irradiated with this jovial influence but they do in a, 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 the connetra level, the, the heart level, the personal committed level. They look along the beam of joviality, as indeed we, the readers, do too. So, just to conclude, I'm sorry I've gone on so long. Those planetary symbols, those spiritual symbols of permanent value, were, I believe, deliberately, consciously, but secretly used as the, the means by which Lewis made these stories about Christ. The books aren't based on the planets, they're based on Lewis's Christian theology, but he uses the planets as the vehicle, the means by which he gives expression to that Christian theology. And he presumably expected what, that we would eventually spot what he was up to, but he wasn't going to tell us what he was up to, because he wanted to communicate to our imaginations to our intuitions, so that we would, we would sense a world at harmony with itself, even though we couldn't say in cold prose exactly how it worked. He, he wanted to do imaginatively what he had done rationally in so much of his non-fiction prose in his apologetics, where he talked about the overlookability of the divine. Each book in its totality conveys the point he wanted to impart. The medium of the book is the message, if you like. So the Chronicles are indeed about Christ, as he said they were, but they're about Christ at a much, in a much deeper, a more sophisticated way 
than we've previously consciously realized. Though I think that we probably have realized it at, a, at, a, an, unconscious, at, a, at an unconscious level. We've sensed that, there, that here is a world at harmony with itself, in which there's a resonance between the Christ character and the story that he inhabits. You could say that it was a trick that Lewis played on us, but I think it was a trick with a very serious purpose. Like a good Socratic teacher, who doesn't lay everything out on a plate for the pupil, but waits for the pupil to ask the right questions, or waits for the pupil to work it out for themselves, very Socratically, Lewis was waiting to see how soon his readers would detect the presiding, the governing spirit of these seven short stories. If we can't detect the governing spirit of a short children's story, well, why should we think we know so much about the divine spirit who upholds the actual universe in which we all live and move and have our being? We teach the world we create. The world Lewis created in these stories is, on the face of it, random and slapdash and a hodgepodge. As, indeed, we feel that the real world, too, is sometimes slapdash and chaotic when we see accidents happen and, and the innocent suffer and all sorts of inexplicable disasters. But at its heart, Narnia is a coherent and purposeful world. It's, it's richly teeming with creative intelligence. As indeed Lewis believed, and as I believe as a Christian, that the real world too is coherent and purposeful and richly teeming with divine intelligence. Down to the curve of every wave and the flight of every insect, as Lewis said. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech. Night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Thank you very much.